if um great so welcome everyone um to our program tonight um i'm going to ask first that everybody mute um, themselves on zoom um but we're very pleased that you're here. I'm Kathy Sabet. I am the College and Career Counselor at Newton South High School. It's my 10th year. Um, and tonight's presentation is going to be about navigating the transition to college for students that have IEPs and 504s. Um, I know that you're going to find this information extremely informative and helpful. And we are going to encourage your questions and ask you to type them into the Q&A feature. Uh, which I will continue to monitor throughout the presentation. Um, so why don't we just get started? Um, I'm so pleased that Chanel France, who I first met on a visit to Hobart and William Smith Colleges last fall, agreed to present tonight to Newton South families and students. Um, her expertise in the area of college disability services um, impressed me quite and uh, I, I knew she was like the person I needed to have for this for this program tonight. So she was wonderful to accept. Um, just a little bit about Chanel. Chanel is currently the Associate Director of the Center for Teaching and Learning for Disability Services at Hobart and William Smith Colleges. And if you're not familiar with that, it's in beautiful Geneva, New York, upstate New York. Uh, before working in this role, Chanel shared that she spent a decade working in K through 12 public education as a special education teacher and administrator. Um, Chanel has a passion for and is dedicated to disability justice. Um, she is the perfect person to be speaking to this very important topic of college transition for our students on learning plans. So I thank her so, so much for being here and her free time <laughs> um, spending it with us. Um, and I'm going to turn the presentation over to her, um, but I am here and um, will participate in questions and answers um, a little bit later. So thank you, Chanel. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy. It is such an honor and a, a pleasure to, to be here with everyone this evening. We have a wonderful turnout. So thank you for showing up and prioritizing this. Um, Kathy, people were still kind of joining. So I made you co-host, so you should be able to admit any folks as they, um, as they trickle in. So as you can see, tonight we're going to talk about um, disability self-advocacy, um, how to navigate that transition from high school to college. Um, it is definitely that. It's a transition. It's a learning curve for both you as a parent or guardian and the student as well. Um, so we're going to spend tonight kind of going over some major talking points, um, but we will also open up the floor um, for some Q&A at the end. Um, I'll also be addressing kind of some frequently asked questions as well, but happy to answer any questions um, as, they, as they come along towards the end of the presentation. Let me get to our next slide. So Kathy did a beautiful job of introducing <laughs> myself. So um, it's a very long title. We like the long titles at Hobart and William Smith Colleges, but um, the Associate Director of our Center for Teaching and Learning for Disability Services. Um, I also work in some of my spare time as an executive functioning coach. Um, and as Kathy mentioned, um, I am a former K-12 special education teacher and administrator. So some of our goals for our time together this evening, we're going to first do a, a brief overview of some of the um, disability justice legislation and talk through the differences between K-12 legislation versus um, 18 plus as, as your students become adults. Um, we'll then talk about some of the important student responsibilities under um, that new legislation review the ways in which you as a parent or guardian can help support your student during the transition. We'll answer some frequently asked questions, share some helpful ideas and strategies, um, and then I'll do a brief overview of what disability services looks like at um, Hobart and William Smith. Um, I can speak specifically to what we do 
I can say some things might be uniform from different institutions, um, but I am an expert in what we do here at HWS, so I want to provide some context for what it looks like here. All right, so ooh, we still got people coming in. It's awesome. All right, so right now as a K through 12 student, you are protected under the Individuals with Disabilities Act or IDEA. Um, so that is a federal law that supports special education and related services um, for children and youth with disabilities. So some of you may currently um, receive support through an IEP, an Individualized Education Program, or a 504 plan. Before you gra graduate, some of you might receive what's called an SOP or a summary of performance written by your case manager or counselor. And if you have an IEP or 504 plan, be sure to request a copy um, along with any testing that was conducted during your evaluation or reevaluation process. Um, I can say that no matter where you end up going, some form of uh, disability related documentation will be required and your IEP, 504 plan, or summary of performance um, can serve as a useful um, form of documentation for that. All right, so once you transition, turn 18 and go to college, or even if you, that might not be your path, but um, once you turn 18 and then no longer in K through 12 education, you are then protected by the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA. So this is um, a federal law. Ooh, we got, okay, never mind. I thought that was someone coming in. It's a question in the chat. So thank you. Yeah, as you have questions, put them in the, the chat or the Q&A and we'll get to those at the end. Um, so this law applies to almost all colleges, universities, and trade schools. Um, the laws mandate an equal opportunity for students with disabilities. Um, so students with disabilities are entitled to benefit from all the surface services of those institutions and to use campus facilities. So as a college student, with a disability, you will be in the driver's seat, so to speak, um, and protected under ADA to receive reasonable accommodations which provide access. So that is a big difference between IDEA and ADA. So IDEA um, allows accommodations, related services, and are really focused on the student's success. That's why in your IEP you have goals to help get you to, to a certain performance level. Once you transition and are covered by the ADA, um, you are guaranteed access for reasonable accommodations, but that access doesn't necessarily guarantee success. And that's a, a big difference between um, the, the federal laws for uh, K-12 versus um, 18 plus. So these are some of the major differences, and I thought that it would be nice to kind of compare and contrast high school versus college. So on the left-hand side, we have um, a few of few things that are related to high school age, and on the right-hand side, we have college. So as we've already discussed, in high school, um, you're governed by the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. In college, you're governed by the Americans with Disabilities Act. In high school, typically um, the parents or guardians and the school are responsible for enforcing the IEP or the 504 plan and ensuring that um, the student is receiving accommodations. However, in college, the student is responsible um, for requesting accommodations and for implementing them and deciding when to implement the accommodations. In high school, Goals are individually designed um, and your, the instruction is also individualized and you might receive modifications. Um, in college, you will receive reasonable accommodations which cannot fundamentally alter the program. So some accommodations that you might have as part of your IEP or your 504 plan might not translate exactly um, in the college setting. In high school, 
I'm sure many of the students, if we have any students on the call here, you get a lot of reminders from your teachers or um, from your case manager, and I'm sure from your parents too about deadlines for assignments. Um, in college, like I said earlier, you're in the driver's seat. So it's your responsibility to refer to the syllabi for each of your courses um, and to complete that work independently. In high school, teachers provide the, the testing accommodations. In college, students must advocate and schedule their timing for assessments. In high school, for your work outside of school, maybe six to 18 hours um, a week. In college, that drastically increases um, and can be up to 27 hours outside of class time. But again, you're not in class from 7.30 to three, um, like you might typically be in high school. You here at HWS, you have four classes. They either meet three times a week for an hour or twice a week for an hour and a half. Um, so you have a lot more flexibility in your schedule. So we talked about some of the differences between high school and college. And I've been saying a lot of things about, well, students are in the driver's seat, they have a lot more responsibility. So let's break that down and look at some of the main responsibilities that a student will have once in college. So wherever you end up going, in order to receive accommodations, you will need to self-identify um, with the Disability Services Office or the equivalent at whatever institution you decide to attend. For us here at HWS, you need to request your accommodations every semester. That doesn't mean that you have to resubmit documentation or go through our interactive process, but um, I'll get to this a bit later. But for me in my position, I am... I need to abide by FERPA, which means that I cannot talk about any student's accommodations with anyone unless I have the student's permission. So the system that we have set in place, students have to request um, their accommodations each semester because their classes change each semester. Therefore, I need to know which professors I can inform about um, a student's accommodations um, and make sure that the student gives me permission to do that before doing such. Um, we also require students to sign and upload any necessary accommodation documents. Um, wherever you go, communication regularly with your faculty <laughs> is going to be essential. Um, and then to self-advocate, to discuss any issues or problems with, um, with faculty and with the disability services uh, team wherever you wherever you end up going, and just be proactive in the communication. Um, that's going to help set you up for success wherever you go. A couple other student responsibilities is to set up arrangements for extra time on tests. For us, the way that we do it, there's no way for us to know when every test is <laughs> being given. So that's a student responsibility to let us know that they have a test coming up and to also inform us that they're requesting to utilize their assessment accommodations. In college, just because you have extended time or distraction reduced environment for an assessment doesn't mean you have to use it. Again, you are in the driver's seat and you get to decide whether you would like to um, use your accommodations or not. But if you do, you need to communicate with us in a timely fashion. And I can certainly guarantee that wherever you end up going, they're gonna need some advance notice as well. Another good skill and responsibility as a college student, you'll need to keep track of your syllabi and your grades. So regardless where you go, you will receive a syllabus for each class at the beginning of the semester. It will map out what the course expectations are it will give you all of your test dates, all of your assignments, all of your required readings, all at the beginning of the semester. So you kind of have a, a loose roadmap as to what this class is going to look like and what the workload is going to look like as well. So it's your responsibility to go through the syllabus, understand um, what, those, what the expectations are from that professor, um, and to also know 
that those expectations cannot be fundamentally altered um, in terms of receiving accommodations under the ADA. Again, regardless of where you go, students are going to need to check their emails regularly. Um, we try our best to communicate with students in many ways here at HWS, but email is certainly our main way of communicating. Um, and I can almost guarantee that that will be the same regardless of where, where your student ends up going. Another thing to consider um, is that if a student decides to study abroad, um, the law that guarantees equal access is Americans with Disabilities Act and might not be recognized um, the same way if a student decides to study abroad. So just understanding um, that it might look very different um, depending on what country you decide to study abroad. Um, I can say that it helps it helped me um, appreciate the the rights and um, protections that we have here in, in America when studying abroad and realizing that it is not the same everywhere else. So just something to consider. All right, so for my parents and guardians who are on the call, um, a few things that might change um, as your role with a, with a student who is transitioning to college. Um, like I mentioned earlier, under FERPA, the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, um, all disability services office employees are unable to discuss information about students without their consent. So best practice and how we practice here at HWS is that we will always communicate directly with the student. Um, and it is a case by case basis. If a student wants to invite their parent in for a meeting, it is just for that singular meeting. It is not a carte blanche um, approval. So we always try and communicate directly with the student and coach them through those communication skills and the self advocacy skills. Um, so as a parent or guardian, it, it's great and we ask that you be a subtle hand of guidance um, in your student's education. I That will be a huge transition because I know that you have most likely been the manager of your child um, and now you kind of transition to being more of a consultant um, and that can be a really difficult transition for parents and guardians. So I recognize all of the time and effort and advocacy that you have needed to do for your child um, K through 12 and that does not go unappreciated. Um, but the best way to help support your child as they transition um, from high school to college is to be um, to be supportive, to be there, and to help guide them and help them build their self-advocacy skills. So encourage your student to take responsibility for their own academic success and their limitations, to seek out resources um, that can help aid in their progress. Um, we say that you can give your child the gift of learning how to resolve issues through their own self-advocacy. Um, you can empower your student to manage challenges on their own, instill a sense of confidence in your child by saying, I believe in you, you can do this, I'm here for you. Um, and opportunities to develop the maturity that will serve them as they move on into adulthood. So I, I, I know and understand that it'll be difficult to let go in a sense, um, but the more that you do for them during this transition time, the more difficult it's going to be for them to learn these skills. So I've been talking a lot about more generalities. I would love to paint a clearer picture of what disability services at HWS looks like. Um, so disability services is placed within our Center for Teaching and Learning. This is an umbrella office that encompasses disability services, student enrichment, and faculty enrichment. We are positioned within this larger office because we recognize that disability services is not um, an island of its own. It requires support um, for all students, uh, but also requires communication and support of faculty. So that is why we're positioned within this larger Center for Teaching and Learning. Um, here at HWS, we use an online program called Accommodate. This online program houses 
um, all documentation and allows us to process accommodation requests. Um, and it also allows students to access their documentation freely. Um, they can request to receive accommodations at any time in their career. They don't need to do it before they get to campus or as a rising first year. Although we do um, encourage students to register sooner than later, because like I mentioned before, just because a student receives accommodations doesn't need doesn't mean that they need to use them right away, but it's best to have them in place and as a safety net rather than being like, oh, I'm just going to try it out without my accommodations. And then it gets to a point where you realize, oh, I probably should have requested accommodations. And now you're kind of delayed and have to go through the process of getting them in place. So again, another tip that proactive, <laughs> the more proactive, the better. Um, and again, it is 100% your choice as a student, whether you want to self-identify. Um, I understand that probably in high school, there, there might be some negative connotations or stigmatization around disability. Uh, but here at HWS, we work very thoughtfully, intentionally, and diligently to destigmatize um, disability. We do not see that as a bad word. Over 30% of our student population is registered with disability services, which is well above the national average. Um, and we, we are out there this month. We're doing tons of programming around disability awareness, hosting documentary screenings and discussions, um, having students in our office for lunch and coffee and donuts. So really creating um, a... A, a community of inclusion. So again, talking about HWS, the most common accommodations that are utilized here on campus um, is extended time for assessments, either time and a half or double time, distraction reduced environment for assessments, breaks during assessments or class, the use of a word processor for assessments or during class to take notes, um, we also provide a myriad um, variety of note-taking assistance and accommodations. Um, and then we also provide alternative text formats such as digital or audio. So I would say those are the most common accommodations that students utilize. Um, but we also provide disability-related non-academic accommodations such as housing, meal plan accommodations, and assistance animals. So in order to request accommodations here at HWS and register officially, um, first step is you need to decide if you want to self-identify with our office. From there, you would complete um, an initial accommodation request on our online portal. You can do that at any time um, in your career here at HWS. It doesn't need to be before you get here. Um, and it can also be done in the comfort of your home, in your residence hall, wherever. Um, that's the beauty of having uh, an online program like this. Um, we do ask for some form of documentation to be uploaded for that initial accommodation request. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that could be in the form of your 504 plan, an IEP, um, a summary of performance, a doctor's note. It could be as extensive as a neuropsych evaluation. Um, just as long as we have some form of documentation that states that there is a history of a disability-related barrier, we can then, um, as part of our interactive process, discuss what those barriers are and see what accommodations could be in place to either help reduce or re remove that barrier. So once you submit an official request for accommodations, you'll receive an email from me with my Calendly link and we will meet, um, if you're doing this before you get to campus as a rising first year, we'll meet over the summer. Um, we might meet in person during the first few weeks of classes. Um, I can say I have a lot of upper class students who are now realizing that they should have uh, requested accommodation. So I, I meet with students throughout the entire school year. Um, but you have to first self-identify, submit your initial accommodation request, and then we have a meeting to talk through um, what those barriers are, and we create a, a collaborative um, 
accommodations list. And then, like I mentioned before, every semester students need to submit a semester request on our online portal. It is no more than 10 clicks. It's very quick, it's very easy, but it allows the student to um, determine which accommodations are, are appropriate given the expectations of each course. Um, so for example, if a student is taking a dance class and they have assessment accommodations, but they don't have any sit down timed exams, they can choose to not have that accommodation be applied to that course because it doesn't make sense or and is not applicable to the context and expectations of that course. And then the last step is an ongoing step to continue to advocate for yourself um, and to be proactive with your communication with both your professors and our, our staff here. Chanel, so, can I maybe mention something? I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, please. Yeah, so, um, so this is a wonderful example of how disability services plays out at Hobart William Smith Colleges, right? Um, and so it's, it's going to maybe vary a little bit from college to college, um, but in general, um, the steps are pretty much what, what, you know, what we've seen with other colleges in terms of, you know, deciding whether to self-identify and when to do that, um, you know, in terms of the accommodation, like the, the procedures such as that, it might be a little bit different, but each school will provide you kind of with their procedures to do that. But I think it's really important to see how does this really play out um, in an actual college setting. So I, I appreciate kind of the detail that you you've shared here, Chanel. Absolutely. And um, a lot of colleges have transitioned and adopted the interactive process, which um, invites the student to be a collaborator in their accommodations. You know, many students, uh, when I was a, a high school special ed English teacher, when they came in as a ninth grader, and I would ask them, so what are your accommodations? A lot of the my ninth graders couldn't answer that question. They had no idea um, what their goals were or what their accommodations were. And so um, as parents or guardians, um, family members, um, I highly encourage you to talk with, with your student about their, their accommodations, um, equip them to understand the impacts of their disability and why they receive what accommodations that they do. Um, because as part of that interactive process, we're having a, a conversation about um, what if any accommodations they've received in the past, how has that accommodation helped remove um, a barrier that they face as a result of their disability. And it's really the student self report that's most important. Documentation is only one component of that, but the student has is living and the best um best form of of documentation because they they should be able to speak um to to the impacts of their disability and eloquently express um what they what they might need to to help remove those barriers another component that i haven't mentioned is that accommodations in college are not set in stone they are fluid and depending on the course expectations a new barrier might present itself um, that a student has never experienced before. So again, as part of the interactive process, a student might have these set of accommodations in place, but then they take this class and they're like, whoa, what is this? So they can come to me say, hey, Chanel, I'm really struggling. This is what it looks like. This is what's being expected of me. And if there's a need to add or modify the accommodations, you don't need to wait three years until the reevaluation. You don't need to wait until you can have a whole um, IEP meeting or a gathering of, of the whole uh, CSE team. It's just a conversation with the student and myself. So like I mentioned, our uh, disability services office is placed under the umbrella office of the Center for Teaching and Learning. Um, one of those components is the student enrichment. So a few of the offerings that are part of the student enrichment program here um, are writing fellows who help with any step of the writing process, study mentors, which are one-on-one -on -one meetings um, that help more specifically with executive functioning skills. So how, 
how can I go through all four of my syllabi and create a calendar for the semester? Um, how can I look ahead and create a prioritization checklist of what I need to do? Um, how do I take 50 pages of reading that I have for, for an assignment and take notes from that? I have my first assessment coming up. How do, what are the best skills to study? Um, so a study mentor can help with all of those um, components. We have teaching fellows um, who are content specific. Um, we have the majority of our departments represented and those are drop-in office hours, similar to the writing fellows where a student can go and ask questions of a teaching fellow um, or just go and do their homework. And if they have questions, there's a teaching fellow there to, to answer and provide some support and guidance. Um, we also have study tables for um, I'd say more specific classes. A lot of the times we'll have study tables for language courses or for our music classes. Um, and those are just course specific. So not content, but a specific class. Um, and we will work together with the professor to identify someone within that class who can um, host study tables. And so students can come together um, at a designated time and work together on assignments or work um, to study together for an upcoming assessment. Um, all of our programs here are peer to peer. They go through a rigorous interview process for our writing fellows. They have to go through an entire writing colleague year of classes um, and mentorship, and then go through an intense interview process as well. So all of our peer-to-peer -peer programs, those students who are employed through our office go through a very intense vetting, <laughs> vetting process. Um, these are all enrichment and not remediation and they are free to all HWS students. There is no additional cost for any of our um, support. So writing fellows, um, I had mentioned, they can help with any step of the writing process. They offer drop-in hours, um, and you can also schedule a one-on-one -on -one, um, meeting if required as well. Our study mentors, as I mentioned, they help more with the executive functioning skills, and those are one-on-one -on -one meetings. For anyone who is a student athlete, we have specific athletic study mentors, and these are um, strong scholars and leaders on each of our athletic teams who have been identified by the coach, and they offer um, support to mostly first years, but to really anyone on the team um, of how to balance the demands of being both a, a student, but the time and energy demands of being an athlete as well. And then more specifically about our teaching fellows, I apologize, the font is super small, but as you can see, there are three, six, nine, 12, four, 13 different departments that are represented. Again, they offer drop-in office hours. Um, and it's a great place to, to build community, even if students don't have a specific question. It's a, a work environment where students are, are focused on getting their work done, very academically driven. And so it's a, a great opportunity to meet other students who are passionate about a, a particular content um, and then just support one another to, to be studious in that environment. And then our study tables specific just to a, a course. Um, and these can be set up for any specific course that is not already being supported by a teaching fellow. So Kathy had sent out a lot of these frequently asked questions and I believe that you may have received these in advance. Um, I know that I've been doing a lot of, a lot of talking um, and I wonder if we might pause before I dive into these FAQs and I just want to give give a moment to monitor a chat our chat and Q and a because several of you have been putting questions in there and I appreciate your your participation and engagement so I want to recognize that yep I'm happy to kind of um, maybe um share the question and then we can respond um one thing I did want to mention that you know just the um 
I've talked to a lot of colleges and the disability services and every college might call it something different and it might be housed in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, what really impressed me about Hobart um, is that it's, it's, um, it's extremely comprehensive, I think. And I think you'll find this too um, at some of maybe smaller schools. So not like the big gigantic like flagship publics necessarily, but um, the comprehensiveness of, of specifically at Hobart or like some smaller schools where, you know, they have the, the tutoring resources, they have, um, you know, the opportunity to schedule a, a meeting with, with, you know, Chanel and, and other members in the, in the department, um, as the student needs, um, that's, that could be something that's really important if you're, if you're not a senior and you're kind of looking at colleges, you might want to look and see, like, if you think um, your child or you are going to need accommodations, want accommodations, like, what, what are, what's the touch points available to you um, for the, for those uh, offices? Um, but I do think you guys are super comprehensive. Um, there are, and I don't know if you can speak to this, Chanel, about how um, there are schools that offer comprehensive programming, and then schools that it's more um, like student initiated um, self-advocacy model. So I don't know if you can speak to the differences that you've seen between like a comprehensive, I'm thinking of something like a Curry College, um, the SALT program at, um, in Arizona, those kinds of programs which are comp more comprehensive. Yeah, so um, here at HWS that we, we don't, uh, I, I wouldn't say, we don't necessarily differentiate or offer um, support specifically to students with disabilities. I, I hope that this is meeting your question, Kathy, um, mm. but it's for, for all students um, because we, we recognize that all students require support whether they have a disability or not. And it's a great way for, um, for the students who do have disabilities to make connections and um, to learn to learn from one another. Um, so we don't necessarily offer um, support groups or anything specific to disabilities, not through our office, but there are many um, affinity groups on campus um, for students that have disabilities and, and want a more specific um, support group to to do programming or advocacy work or or things like that. Did that answer your question, Kathy? Yeah, I think I just wanted to also just mention that you know some schools that have like the Curry program, their PAL program um, is one that a lot of people know about. That's considered a comprehensive program in that it's it costs extra to participate in that. Mm -hmm. you can apply. Um, to be part of that program. Westfield State also offers that in Massachusetts. Um, so, um, and those are a little bit higher touch, I think. Um, and the expectation is like, you know, you'd probably have more like weekly consistent, um, you know, contact um, mm -hmm. uh, through, you know, while you're involved with the disability services um, or while you're involved in those programs. So just know that there are differences. You'll see more schools that don't have comprehensive programs that are just like as, as Hobart is, like it's free and open to students, um, yeah. you know, whenever they feel like they need it. Um, and if you have accommodations in high school and um, you want to carry some of those over, or at least have those considered to be carried over to college, you know, it's it's probably a good idea to to make connections, but um, so there are differences between comprehensive and you know yes. disability offices that you a student would access. I just guess I wanted to make that point. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, um, so a couple questions, um, and then we could talk about some of the ones we have on the screen here too. Um, one person asked, "What happens if your child turns eighteen while they're in high school in terms of the IDEA versus the ADA?" Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if they are still registered and as a high school student, they are still covered by IDEA. But once they graduate and are no longer in um, public or private schooling and are transitioning to their <laughs> their next step in life, um, then ADA kicks in. But it, as long as they are still registered as a school-age student in a private or public um, 
high school, then IDEA is still applicable. Great question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one person asked, my student changed from an IEP to a 504 after their three-year evaluation, mm -hmm. but did not repeat testing at that time. Uh, will the 504 help them in college under these circumstances? I can speak specifically for our office. We do accept a 504 plan as sufficient documentation. Um, I can say that the trend in higher ed is to um, is shifting more to the social model or the social justice model of disability, um, which recognizes that they're that getting a full comprehensive neuropsych might present a barrier right off the bat when a student actually needs accommodation. So our our philosophical standpoint is that we don't want to put any additional barriers in place to receive um, accommodation. So a 504 plan is absolutely um, sufficient. Um, but I, I also know that we are a, a bit of an outlier um, in terms of, of our guidelines and expectations. So um, certainly a question to ask um, when you are looking at various institutions um, to see what their guidelines are for um, for documentation. Yeah, and, and we usually advise, you know, to try and have your any testing that you take with you to college to be within um, no more than three years. Um, so that that's considered current. Um, and the same thing with with the 504, like, you know, any any kind of documentation you have based on what the 504 is, um, you know, just just as long as that's current within within three years. So that's that's sort of an important piece. Most most colleges, that's what they're looking for, too. Yeah, I hope that answers questions. Your question. Um, so one person was concerned about, um, you know, disclosing disability status um, to colleges um, and um, that I think this is probably more of an admissions question. Um, you know, it, it, is it a good idea to disclose it um, to the college or not? Um, that, that's the student's choice. Um, yeah. I, I can say that um, a student would and should not not be accepted because they are sharing that maybe in their um you know statement um or in their you know letter to to wherever they're applying um that in and of itself is against the law and against the Americans with Disabilities Act because um it should be non-discriminatory um so if if a student feels strongly and wants to let the admissions of a of an institution know that right off the bat that would not impact or deter um at least our our admissions from accepting a student and should not deter any admissions office because that would be discriminatory yeah and from a, an admission standpoint um college is actually um you know for all the reasons that chanel mentioned you know that would be you know illegal to do that um but but you know, the more information they have about, you know, what would make that that particular college a fit for your student and their needs from an academic and a social standpoint, mm -hmm. it's really important. So uh, it, it is the student's decision whether they want to disclose that in the admissions process, um, for sure. Um, but again, like we're always looking for the fit, you know, does the school have what the student is looking for? Um, you know, social, academic, financial, right? Um, and so, and part of the application process is about kind of, you know, articulating how the connection, you know, how that particular school connects for you. And if accommodations are an important part of it, then it makes a lot of sense that it, it would be important to kind of talk through that. It shows self-awareness, um, shows self-advocacy, that sort of thing as well, which I think are all PowerPoints um, as a candidate. So um, hopefully that answers the question there too. Um, do colleges have quotas for disabled students or is this um, failing as DEI fails, falls, excuse me. I don't know if I understand. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, if 
they're I'm thinking maybe in the similar to affirmative action perhaps mm -hmm. um but there there's no quota or like a, a ceiling of how many students with disabilities we can or cannot accept because not all students decide to share that information right off the bat um okay. like i mentioned earlier we're we're seeing an increase of um a lot of upper class students registering with us and that part of that is because kind of a reaction to ai so professors are giving more in class timed assessments um whereas a lot of the assessments were more pro uh project or um or presentation based and so a student that had a finite time limit to complete an assessment didn't necessarily need their accommodations but now we're seeing an increase in that um and so our our numbers and, and students who are registered with us has has increased drastically um just over the past semester um so there's really no way to to know how many students with with disabilities there there are on campus because some might still be here but haven't decided to register with us um so there there is no no cap or expected number for students with disabilities. I hope that that answers the question. I think it's also an important point that you made in terms of just like how fluid needs can be. Like I had never even thought of AI as mm -hmm. being so like having such an impact in the way like teachers now like might actually, you know, grade or, you know, present assessments and that sort of thing. So um, I think it's really important to, to, to know like, it isn't like high school where like you, you have to, you know, you get diagnosed, you get a, an IEP or a 504 and then, you know, kind of like you're, you're always going to have that. Um, it, it does change, you know, as, as the needs need to change or, um, and even like the second point um, on the, on the screen here, we, we talk about like, when is the best time to speak to somebody about supports? Mm -hmm. Um, the fact that you said like it doesn't have to maybe the student wants to try out like college without supports necessarily just mm -hmm. kind of get a, a, a lay of the land and then you know that that's open to them it doesn't have to be at the starting point but on the other hand it, it could also be at the very you know start of school to set themselves up depending on what their needs are so I don't know can you maybe talk a little bit about about what you see and like I know you talked about summer and first semester yeah, so um, my professional recommendation would be if you, if a student is accustomed to receiving accommodations, um, that it's not, it's not giving a leg up, it is leveling the playing field, it is not something to be embarrassed about or to think that you are being an inconvenience, it is your right, um, <laughs> and so that's part of disability justice, so um, that's why I encourage students who have received accommodations in the past to register sooner than later, uh, because you can decide whether you want to use them or not. Um, as, as quickly and responsive as we try to be, it's not an overnight thing either. So um, we've been seeing a lot of students. This is our midterm week right now, and we're seeing a lot of students who are like, oh, I have a test this week, but I didn't register for accommodations, but I need my extended time for my test tomorrow. And that's just not a reasonable ask. There's there's no way with our bandwidth, we're office of two, it's, it's not going to happen. So if you want the opportunity to use an accommodation at some point, do it sooner than later, and it's in your back pocket if you want to use it. But that's just my personal, professional um, advice. It's really up to the student to decide um, ultimately when when to do so. Mm -hmm. um, something that I didn't mention is we also, also provide temporary accommodations. That might be um, for someone who's experiencing a, a traumatic brain injury, such as a concussion, that could be either sports or not sports related. Um, maybe a student is getting surgery and is going to be on crutches, using crutches. Uh, we can get temporary accommodations in place for that. We have a lot of students with some shoulders and wrist injuries, um, recovering from surgery. So we can get a uh, um, accommodations in place for that recovery time as well. So that's also a, a service and support that we provide. 
Hey, Chanel, do you see like prospective students come by the office and just kind of check out what you guys have to offer? Yeah, um, right now, particularly, I I see an uptick. You know, I I offer um, one on one Zoom sessions if if it's requested of me. Um, right now in the spring semester, we offer three, oh no, four admitted students days where um, where someone from our office is present and can answer questions. Um, I also met individually which, with a lot of families over the uh, February break. For those in, in New York, we get a, a week off in Feb or public schools get a week off in February. I was still in the office, so I could meet with those families. Um, but if you either, if you are interested in Hobart and William Smith Colleges and have questions and would like to see our office, meet myself and my colleagues, um, you can reach out and schedule either a virtual or in-person meeting. Sometimes we'll have admissions connect a family with me because they shared um, in their interview or um, in their statement of purpose that they had a disability. Um, and so going back to what Kathy had said earlier, um, it can be it can be good to share that information because admissions will connect me with a family and say, oh, you should definitely meet with Chanel and and get connected and learn more about the resources that are available. Yep. And so I mean that's that's you know at, at Hobart, but it's also other schools as well. So yeah. Um, if if a college um, that you're visiting in the in the spring, um, you know, if if you're considering needing supports, um, and it's not on your 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 informational session or tour, you know, it might be something that you'd want to like seek it out and and see if you can just kind of like check in there and and at least like read some of the bulletin boards, maybe speak to somebody, get a brochure or something like that, just to familiarize yourself and the and your student with you know where it is. What kind, what kind of uh, uh, offerings do they have? Yeah, exactly. Um, I don't see any more questions here, but um, I think we were gonna be open to maybe, um, maybe we could do like five minutes of um, questions. If anybody in the call wants to put, raise their hand, use that little um, icon, raise your hand, and then we can unmute you and then you can feel free to ask a, a question. I'm gonna go to the last slide so y'all can have my oop, my my email if you would like. And yeah, so if anyone has a question, you can use the reaction um, icon to raise your hand. Anybody? Are you seeing? I'm not seeing anybody raising their hand. Or feel free to to type something in the Q and A or the chat. Yep. No, perhaps we've done such a stellar job, Kathy. That <laughs> I mean, it's a lot of it's a lot of territory to cover, but um, I I think the the main thing is you know the points you made that that really resonated for me is that you know the student understanding what their disability <laughs> is, um, and what their needs are, and how that's gonna you know how that's gonna translate in, in a classroom and how it was in high school and then meeting maybe with disability services at the colleges they're, they're going to attend um, and then seeing how that potentially would be considered a reasonable accommodation at their institution. Right. Um, I think is really, really important. Again, the transition and I feel like, um, and you said it so nicely, is it's gonna be a lot smoother if the student kind of owns that process, right? Mm -hmm. With the support, of you know, parents and caregivers, obviously. Um, looks like we have a couple questions. Let's see. Oh, thank you, thank you. This has been very helpful. <laughs> wonderful. Oh, good. <laughs> wonderful I do, time. I do see a hand raised, Susan Sayer. I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly, but feel free to to unmute and ask your question, or if you'd rather type it. Yeah, um, Ty, I just put it actually into the chat. Um, which I was just curious if you could explain a little bit more when you say that the students have the opp opportunity to utilize accommodations. Is that like from class to class? Is that like different moments within the same class? Is that semester to semester? I just, I didn't quite understand that part. Yes. Great question, Susan. Um, so mo most applicable, it would be for um, 
testing a set of accommodation. So let's say that a student is approved or has been granted saying, yes, um, you have access to use extended time and you can take your test in a distraction reduced environment. Um, that does not mean that the professor is going to provide that for every single assessment. Um, and a student might feel really confident about an upcoming assessment and they're like, you know, I don't, I don't need my extended time for this test and this is a really small classroom so I don't think I'm going to be distracted. And so that's their choice to be like, you know, I'm going to take the test in the classroom with the rest of my peers and not request um, additional time time for this. Um, it could also be for, you know, an alternative text accommodation. We're saying you have access to request um, a digital or audio version of a text, but maybe they, they decide that they only want it for one or three of their required readings for, um, for a text. Um, it could also mean um, that, you know, we're saying you could take breaks during an assessment, but they don't need it at that time, so they don't need to use it. So um, so that's what I, I meant, and I hope that clarifies kind of saying we're approving and giving you access to these accommodations, but they might not be relevant or a student might not want to use them. Um, and again, if they don't request to have them be applied to a specific semester by submitting their semester request, then there's I cannot communicate to the professor so the professors are unaware of their accommodations um, and uh, accommodations are also not retroactive. So even if a student is approved for accommodations, but they haven't submitted their semester request and their professors haven't been informed, um, they can't be like, oh, well, I have extended time on a test. I need to get it, but they never requested it and they didn't take the necessary steps to, to get those in place um, for that specific semester and for any specific classes. So plan ahead is a, is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, one person asked, um, you mentioned three-year evaluation a couple of times. I, I think I did as well. What exactly is that? Do you wanna share just when you were in K-12 um, education? Yeah, so um, <laughs> a component of IDEA is that all students um, with who are receiving um, service disability related services that um, they should undergo a reevaluation process um, every three years. That could mean that they go through an like the entire battery of of um, assessments and go through the entire uh, psychoeducational reevaluation and testing. It could also be an agreement of the um, comprehensive service team to say, um, no, we have enough uh, documentation and evidence to support um, that we're go going to keep things as, as is. But um, students should have the opportunity legally to be reevaluated every three years. Yep, yep. Um, and, and one interesting question um, is um, someone said in high school, their student takes advantage of retesting as mm -hmm. an accommodation. Mm -hmm. Is that available in college? That is not um, an accommodation that we offer here. Yeah, and that's a good question, I think, to take to different colleges as you visit colleges or disability services. Even if, even if you can't like to actually talk to somebody there, but you know, at least get a name that you could submit an email. I guess would be okay. Would you say? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, like Chanel had mentioned, the, the term reasonable accommodations is something you see a lot at colleges. Um, and it's just, it's one of those things that, you know, colleges and high schools, what, what they offer for accommodations can, can look very different. Mm -hmm. um, and so just because it's in your IEP or there's testing to, to suggest um, to support that for high school does not mean it's going to transition to, to college. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. you know? That is correct. Yeah. yeah so uh, to ex expand upon that, 
Um, here at HWS, we are a four-year residential um, institution where um, as part of our expectations that in-class participation is a fundamental component of all of our class um, expectations. Therefore, um, it is not seen reasonable to provide an accommodation that allows a student to um, join or participate asynchronously or via Zoom, because that, in order to allow all professors um, the opportunity to have the training, to have the equipment, to have um, the cameras set up, that would be seen as an undue burden. Um, and it's not reasonable to ask a professor um, to do that. And that's that's simply a limitation of what we are able to provide here. Um, at other institutions, it, it might not be considered um, an undue burden, and that could be seen as an as a reasonable accommodation. So um, some of those will vary from institution to institution. Yep, yep. And we had um, we had a question sort of related to that, like how does the size of the college affect the experience? Mm. Um, you know, a big school versus a smaller school like Hobart. Um, you know, does a student get lost in a big college? You know, again, I think it depends on the student. Um, sometimes like Hobart, like you, you guys are just about 2000, maybe mm -hmm. just under. So very similar to the size of Newton South. Um, with a smaller school like a Hobart or, or you know, kind of like a smaller school setting, it's sort of baked in that you have a little bit more, I think, personalized attention, both from like the services that are offered to students and also faculty. Oh, yeah. Um, but then again, like what what's available, you know, is, is that going to help the student at a bigger school like a UMass potentially? It's going to probably that doesn't have a comprehensive um, support program, disability support program. Um, it's going to require the student to be able to advocate that much more in a bigger setting. Mm -hmm. But maybe they have the resources available or they have the, the philosophy that, you know, asynchronous learning, Zoom cameras, recording and stuff like that's all okay. And maybe that works better for your student. So again, it's like, where's the fit? I think that's the key that, you know, you want to see like where the fit is. And, and again, look at services as something that maybe then your child or student isn't going to need those for all four years. You know, maybe they'll, they'll need that begin in the beginning um, or be able to access it as they need to. Um, but ultimately learn, you know, the, the strategies necessary to kind of navigate this on their own. But um, so there's, I guess there's no one size fit all when it comes to this, but just, I think hopefully like through this presentation, I know like um, having the, the specifics related to Hobart um, really helps. I hope for you as you're looking at other schools to com compare and be, you know, like, hey, they can offer these sort of things. What do you offer in terms of writing tutors, writing centers, um, supports for students with with um, time management, that sort of thing. So um, I, I think it's been just wonderful, comprehensive information that you've shared, very clear. Um, and I really, really appreciate um, you being here, Chanel, and your expertise. Um, let me just look one more time. Also, more question. Do accommodations you mentioned refer to housing and physical supports if the student needs a kitchenette? Yeah, so um, here that would be considered a non-academic accommodation. Um, so there would be um, go through a similar request process. We have additional documentation for um, the non-academic accommodations. Um, and then it's presented to a committee um, and reviewed by, by the members of the committee. Um, also here at Hobart and William Smith, all non-academic accommodations um, unless otherwise noted by, you know, the current healthcare provider that su provides the support, those non-academic accommodations will follow the student their entire time on campus. Um, so they don't need to submit a semester request um, every semester for um, if they're approved for a single room or if they're approved for access to a kitchen um, or if they have a reduced meal plan. Um, so that's that's one difference between our academic and non-academic accommodations. 
but that would follow them um, for sure. That's great. So great food for thought, great information. Um, and again, thank you for your time. This is has been recorded. Um, it will be, I'll put up the slides as well as the recording on the um, Newton South College and Career Center webpage if you don't know how to find that. Um, if you go to the main high school webpage under count, counseling, there's a tab at the top and just you'll just hover over that and you'll find College and Career Center and it'll, it'll be there. I, I would imagine it'll be there by the end of this week.